Good evening, Your Excellency. We're here tonight to talk about you and your art. So could you please start off by introducing yourself? Hello, I am Baroness Morgan O'Sheehan of Adiantum. I have lived in the Principality of the Summits my entire life. And I had the honor of being present at the first Coronet Tournament. And I am honored to be here today and to be considered as Alpine Scholar in this Arts and Sciences Championship. And I am honored to be the first virtual contestant. Thank you very much. I was hoping you could start off by telling, telling us all about the sources of inspiration. What inspires you with your art? Uh, one of my main sources of inspiration is the people uh, around me. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from hearing what inspires others, such as my husband in, asked me to look up 12th century garb for him, mm. and through his passion, I found my own passion. And um, <clears throat> it has become an area of study of which I love quite a bit. Oh, are there any other examples where you've been... Yeah, I, I love extant clothing. I am very passionate about going to the surviving objects of the Middle Ages and trying to remake them as one maker to another. So I love the process of creating something and learning about it from doing. Oh, that leads me into my next question. Could you tell, tell us about your process of creating? What how do you go from idea to, you know, through creation to final product? Yeah. So usually it starts with finding an, a picture that I can't get out of my head. And so I found, for example, a lovely piece of linen from the 11th century, possibly Egyptian or Persian manufacture. And it is block printed in four or five different passes and so there's, you know, a, a base layer where it lays a background mm -hmm. color and then you have a detail layer in a contrast in color. And then there's another block that goes over the top with sizing and then you gild it. So just by looking at this piece of fabric, I can break down the steps that it took to create it and thereby recreate it with my own hands. So you're saying you, you looked at at this, at a photograph of an extant object? Yes, there's a piece in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I went to their website, found this lovely little piece of uh, block printed linen and had to have my own. Great. And and so then you say by looking at that, you, you break it down into the steps it... Yeah, so the more you're familiar with how the process works, you can sort of uh, tell which elements come from which stage in the design. This one goes underneath that one. And, uh, you know, for example, with gilding, you have to lay down a size that is slightly tacky and then put the gold leaf on top. So that's just to get one gold color, you're stamping and burnishing. Okay, uh, so... After you've decided what you're going to make, what's inspired you, and how you're going to break it down, how then do you decide what materials you're going to work with? Well, I love to find out what people in the Middle Ages would have used, and oftentimes the exact duplicates of tools or materials are out of my pocketbook. Um, so I go thrifting. Um, I peruse all the thrift stores in town on a regular basis so I will pick up tools long before I know how to use them and uh, then I will you know collect enough materials and tools to just go to town and with block printing when I pick that up um, it started with a couple of knives and a couple of pieces of carving uh, blanks from the hobby store and now I've got somewhere around 50 to 100 blocks I've carved. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I've lost track. So you're saying that in cases where the period object or material would be too expensive, you, you use a modern substitute? Oh, yeah. Well, I use whatever I can find. Um, and then even if I don't like how that particular product works, like say, um, not a particular fan of rubber rubber stamps to block print with, but I'll still experiment with them so that I can tell somebody else how to use them. 
Um, I find that I much prefer carving my blocks in wood, but when I have a tight deadline, I like linoleum because I can get a block carved in a uh, you know, quarter of the amount of time than wood. Okay. Um, so what would you say is the biggest lesson you have learned so far throughout your time as an artisan in this society? Failure is an important part of the process and not something that needs to be run away from. I have a high demand of perfection in myself. And when I do not meet that expectation, I would find it very difficult to want to continue on with, pro with a project if I was encountering a barrier or wasn't as good as I liked. And with my costuming, because I was doing it for so long, I felt like I should be better than I was, you know, because I have amazing people around me mm -hmm. who are incredibly talented, but I can't do what they do. However, I do what I do really well. So I do rectangular construction really well, but I can't fit a garment on a body um, with like draping. It is a completely different thought process and set of skills. So, you know, I, I just, my need for perfection mm -hmm. is often an illusion of, um, needing to practice more and play more and regain my joy in what I do. So what would you say that your strengths as an artisan are? I, I keep getting back up and I am so curious. I love making things and I love teaching people how to do it. Uh, my first jobs when I was a teenager were working in a fabric store and then working in a craft store. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part of that job was helping people figure out not only what they needed to purchase in order to get what they wanted, but also to help them figure out the process. Um, I was really lucky in that my job at Ben Franklin wanted us to not only help the customer no matter where they went in the store, it wasn't like as soon as they stepped off of my aisle, I was done with them. They encouraged us to get to know the products and our people. And that helped me um, kind of develop into this person who is always curious to learn new things and play with new toys. That's good. Uh, what areas would you like to improve in as an artisan? Um, being more confident in my knowledge. I have uh, some major self-esteem setbacks where I don't always have as much faith in myself as I believe others do. And I know I'm kind of smart and pretty smart and that people tell me. And so I just need to be um, more gracious with myself as I try to be smart. Oh, I'd like to backtrack for a moment. When you were talking about some of the uh, your strengths as an artisan, you had talked about liking to teach people um, from your jobs at Ben Franklin. Uh, what have you done to teach or share your arts with people in the society? Oh, um, well, anybody who's nice enough not to run away as soon as I open my mouth will will usually eventually hear about costuming or block printing or if they have a curiosity and I know something about it I will um, without steamrollering <laughs> I do try to um, foster curiosity in others um, I've also taught formal classes um, I love teaching rectangular construction I am better in a one-on-one -on -one because I tend to kind of want to share everything and that doesn't work when you've got about 20 people you're trying to teach. But I've taught block printing classes. I've taught rectangular construction classes. Um, I even got to participate in a virtual class. And um, I do try to do some uh, teaching through my modern medieval maker channel on Instagram and YouTube. But that's hobbyist. So I don't always update regularly. Oh, did you say the modern medieval maker? The you... modern, at modern, the modern medieval maker. 
on Instagram and Yahoo. Or, excuse me, YouTube. Okay, you heard it here, folks. Uh, if you want to look her up afterwards, that's her information. Um, next, I'd really like to ask you, what was your inspiration to enter the Arts and Sciences Championship for the Principality? Um, well, 16 years ago, I did this very thing and I entered because I was scared. Uh, I was scared of competitions and I was scared of putting myself out there. And it was until I became Baroness, one of my favorite jobs in the SCA. It was wonderful to be able to encourage others to create. And this time around, I have a completely different perspective in life. I've had many changes in my self and in my family and in the SCA. And so I feel like I have a different perspective to put forth. And I feel like with the changes that are happening in the SCA, where we are now looking for ways to meet people where they are, instead of making everybody fit into the same mode, model, so to speak. I want to help find alternative ways for artisans, especially artisans with um, non-neurotypical experiences. Um, you know, for a lot of us, it's very difficult to be an artisan in the SCA when competition seems to be the way to get noticed. And it's really intimidating for people who, like me, suffer from anxiety or self-esteem issues. And so I want to do this because it's very scary and I want other people not to be as scared of it. So you want to be a, an, an example that if, if you could do it, it's okay? Or? Even an old dog can learn some new tricks. <laughs> okay, I, I'm curious here. I'd like to know your answer. What's the difference in your mind, if any, between an art and a science? Uh, all art is a scientific process. All science is an artistic process. There is not one without the other. You cannot, you cannot separate the two because art is a discovery of, you know, if I use this paint on that paint, what color pulls through? If I mix this and that, do I get a new dye or do I ruin a whole bunch of expensive materials? So there's always a scientific curious process. You know, um, block printing for me was that exact thing where I'm going through different materials. I'm experimenting with every single paint I can get across. I, I have different kind of knives to see what works with what material. It's all an experiment. It's all a scientific process. Speaking of experiments and block printing, I see behind you on that panel there's there's uh, some different samples. Is yeah. there anything you'd like to share about those? Uh, well, this is one of my favorites, but it all actually may end up being a fraud. So that was a very interesting discovery that not all medieval objects are medieval, even if they're on a museum website. Um, so there was a collector that may have been hoodwinked, and a lot of his collection, when it was dispersed, was just taken at face value. And so now there's a lot of kind of backtracking to find out, you know, are these you know, authentic or not. So, um, but I love this particular one because of. Can you the... describe it? Just, it might be small. Yeah, on so it's, <laughs> it's an all over floral pattern and there are two birds facing each other Two deer in the original, but since I have two dogs, I carve dogs instead. And then the negative space of the design, when you look at it as a whole, turns into a badger face. And I am a Hufflepuff, and that is a very big part of my outlook on life. And so I'm wrapping the badger. Okay. So uh, this was a block that I designed for um, Viscount Turk for his knighting, tab, uh, knighting caftan. And it is a Persian peacock. And then I have a collection of medieval blocks based on um, the tiles that are in the cathedrals, mm -hmm. uh, the encaustic tiles. And I just, they are 
very similar patterns that are found on fabrics and fantastic simple designs in negative space. So they lend themselves to block printing very well. Are those, did you use the same material in all of those, the same paint or are those? Uh... Oh, well, you can't see the full uh, range here, but this uh, is actually a test print. And so it goes through the various different colors to find out what showed up on the black wool the best. And it ended up being a combination of yellow and a gold metallic paint that popped. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of final questions to wrap up so we don't go on too long. Uh, what sort of peer-like qualities do you envision that you would be able to bring to the role as a &S champion of the summits? Um, I believe that I, I approach every day with peer-like qualities, so I would bring myself. Um, I, again, going back to the kind of Hufflepuff analogy, mm -hmm. I believe that there is room for everyone. There is a place for everyone and everyone should have a voice. And so um, for me, I just want to keep on being me and just do it louder. So it sounds like you'd be an advocate for inclusivity and diversity in the arts. I, absolutely. It, it's how I approached being Baroness and I couldn't stop once we stepped down. So I don't see a difference in my ANS versus my Are self. There... Are there any final thoughts or, or things you'd really like to share before we sign off? Um, just that it is even an honor just to, to be able to do this. Um, again, going back to the accommodations for mental health, I tend to get panic attacks when we do any winter driving. And so South March is really difficult for me in the winter. Um, and my thanks that I have the opportunity to participate when I can't be present. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I hope that I am worthy and thank you. <laughs>